us worship. Here we go. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. Hey. See what our Savior has done. See how. Can I get an amen tonight? Awesome. Welcome to the refinery. So glad you guys are here. Before we continue worship, can you guys do this? Whether you're in the room or online, turn around, welcome someone, and then let's continue singing together.
song called Reckless Love by Corey Ashbery. This week I spent some time researching this song and I came across this quote that Corey said. He said, when I use the phrase, the reckless love of God, I'm not saying that God himself is reckless. I am, however, saying that the way he loves is in many regards quite so. His love bankrupt heaven for you. His love doesn't consider himself first. His love isn't selfish or self-serving. He doesn't wonder what he'll gain or lose by putting himself out there. He simply gives himself away on the off chance that one of us might look back at him and offer ourselves in return. The recklessness of his love is seen most clearly in this. It gets him hurt over and over. Make no mistake, our sin pains his heart, yet he opens up and allows us in every time. His love saw when you hated him. When all logic said they'll reject me, he said, I don't care if it kills me, I'm laying my heart on the line. Jesus loves us recklessly. He loves us extravagantly. He loves us so much he was willing to die for us. Romans 5, 6, and 7 says, Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Each week here at Refinery, we have the opportunity to take communion. We have the opportunity to slow down and remember why we're here. To remember the fact that Jesus loves us so recklessly, so extravagantly that he was willing to die so that you and I could be forgiven. He was willing to take our place when we hated him, when we wanted nothing to do with him. He loved us in our sin. He loves us despite anything we've ever said or done. And he chooses us. When you walked in, you should have received a cup and it has some bread and some juice in it. And if you're joining us online, I encourage you to grab some bread and some juice. We're gonna have an opportunity to take these elements. They represent Jesus's blood and body on the cross. But before you take them, I want you to spend some time really thinking about this extravagant, reckless love that Jesus has for us. The fact that he chose you the fact that nothing you could ever say or do will change the way he sees you. Will you pray with me? God, you love us so amazingly. God, it goes beyond anything we could ask or imagine. God, you choose us time and again. God, you loved us so much you were willing to take our place so that we could be forgiven. God, so that we could have a relationship with you. You chose us. God, prepare us today. Hey guys, my name's Matt, and I am the worship director at the Refinery Christian Church. My faith journey begins at the tail end of my senior year in high school in Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, my parents were divorced, and my brother and I were dealing with that. And for my whole life, 
I just felt like I was running from something. It felt like something was chasing after me and I would run to alcohol and I would run to whatever substance my friends were into at the time and I'd run to pornography. And that's where I'd find a safe hiding place. My father would one day bring us to a small Filipino church in the valley and that's where Christ would find my family. And at the time I played trumpet, but trumpet doesn't exactly fit the contemporary worship vibe. So I picked up a guitar and over the next seven years, I would become the worship leader at this small Filipino church. And in the process of all that, I would leave my dad's house. I would end up living with my pastor at the time and the worship team because we all lived in the same house. And we would write an album together. We would tour all of Southeast Asia together. These people would become my family and we would do everything together. Fast forward, I would fall into these old habits and again, I would feel like I'm running from something and I would run right to that, that bottle of alcohol. I would run right to those pills and I ran right to pornography and fall into my old habits. And this time it got out. People found out and this would be something normally handled with grace and discretion, but the people closest to me handled it with condemnation and judgment. And I found myself once again on the run and my girlfriend, who would become my wife, at the time we had a conversation and I told her, I don't know if I ever want to go back to church, but I 100% do not want to be a worship leader anymore and I will never, never do this again. And if you had told me 10 years ago that this is where my life would be, I wouldn't have believed you. In a great church, in a great place, um, once again, a worship leader. And it all, culminated in this one moment where I didn't have to run anymore. It was the love of God that was chasing me the whole time. And if you're sitting there watching this, I pray that you realize that you don't have to run anymore, that the safety and the security that you're looking for, it's chasing after you. And I know because of experience. So hear me when I say that the goodness of God will never stop chasing after you. Church, we're gonna sing a new song called The Goodness of God and it's here right now. It's still chasing after you in this moment. And that's why we sing. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days, I am held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up till I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. Here's our chorus why we sing. Is 
even when I didn't know what was chasing me, it was you. Thank you for the truth that said I don't have to run anymore, that I don't have to be weary or tired because you're there, and your goodness and your grace have never stopped chasing after me. Father, I pray that you remind us now, even in this moment, that we don't have to run, and that even when we do, you'll still chase after us. Thank you for your love that never stops. Thank you for your love that never grows weary of loving us. Thank you for a heart that is never far from ours. We love you in this place. We love you and we glorify you, for you are good. In Jesus' precious name, everyone said, amen and amen. Hallelujah. Church, you can be seated in this moment. Matt, thank you so much for sharing your story. Thanks for being vulnerable and talking about how a wound from other people changed your life. But congratulations on your recovery and we're so, so thankful that you're part of the Refinery family. Being part of the Refinery refinery family means that we want to continually grow in our faith. And I want to just challenge you to get involved in Refinery Academy this fall. It's going to be collegiate level, biblical teaching and theological training. 
It's going to be so valuable and so important for you. Taught by some of the best teachers in the country. And we are so excited for that. So get some more information and make sure that you sign up to be part of Refinery Academy. Well, we're getting ready to continue our series, When We Hurt. And today we're talking about when others cause our wounds and cause our pain. And I know that most of us have experienced hurt at the hands of other people. So as we get ready to begin, I want you to, to take note here. Now, if you're watching the side screens, I want you to take your eyes off the side screens and look to the center screen. Everybody looking at the center screen now? Okay, in just one minute, you're gonna get an opportunity to experience every man's envy and every woman's desire, Aaron McKee, right here. You just, you never know what to expect with Chad, right? So I, mean, I actually didn't see that till just before service when we were running through rehearsal. I had no idea Chad had done that, but anyway, we are in week three of our series called When We Hurt. And if you've been around the refinery at any point in 2021, you know that we have this overarching theme for the year where we are telling stories that tell the story. We're telling stories that point us back to Jesus, stories that maybe reveal a little bit about the weaknesses and the struggles of the people that we find in the Bible. And a lot of times, unfortunately, we resonate with those stories. Uh, and I say unfortunately because sometimes that brings hurt, that brings heartache. But there's also this amazing power of redemption that we see over and over and over as we've just looked at some of these characters. And so in this series, when we hurt, we kicked it off a couple of weeks ago. And we actually looked at when you hurt from a spiritual attack. And the story we told was the story of Job from the Bible where Satan actually goes and he's having this conversation with God and Satan's like, yeah, sure, Job's, sure he's honoring to you. Sure, he's faithful to you. Look at everything he has. He has this amazing family. He has all this wealth. Why wouldn't he trust you? And God gives Satan permission in that moment, says, okay, you can go ahead. Like You can do what you want to do, but you can't hurt him physically. That's how it starts off. And we heard the loss that Job encountered with loss of family loss of wealth, loss of so much in his life. But ultimately, what we see in the end is that, God, that Job remained faithful to God and God redeemed him. Last week, Chad talked to us specifically about when God causes hurt in our life. When the challenges that, that even God sometimes will, will put hurt in our life, difficulty in our life, so that we can grow deeper and closer to him. And we looked at that through the life of Paul. Paul from the New Testament, some of you know, he was previously, before he was called Paul, he was called Saul. He was a persecutor of Christians, and yet he encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus and ended up going into ministry, the greatest missionary probably that there ever was in the history of the world. And he wrote about half of the New Testament books that we read. Again, we see out of hurt, we see redemption. So today we're going to talk about how do we handle, how do we deal with when we've been hurt by others, when we've been hurt by other people in our life. And I'm just going to share with you, I know in my life personally, but also as I've done pastoral counseling and just got to know people and talk to people in relationship, I can tell you the deepest hurt, the biggest wounds, the biggest scars that so many of us have are the hurts that we've experienced through family and through close friendships. So I just want to ask you just for a moment to be vulnerable just for a moment. By show of hands, how many in this room have been hurt by somebody in your family or by a close friend at some point in your life? I would venture a guess that most hands are up. Most of us have experienced that at some point in our life. And the question is, how do we process through that? How do we get to the other side of the hurt? Well, today we're going to be looking at the story of Joseph from the Old Testament. Some of you are probably a little bit familiar with the story of Joseph. It's often referred to as Joseph, the coat of many colors. And I'm going to unpack his story for you share with you some of the hurts that he experienced, but we also want to look at 
How was he redeemed through that? And maybe even more importantly, how did God redeem others through that story of Joseph? Now, this story of Joseph comes from the book of Genesis, the very first book in your Bible, beginning in chapter 37, and it actually goes all the way to chapter 50. So whether you're watching online or you're in the room, uh, I would encourage you if you have a, a physical Bible with you, or maybe your physical Bible is on a phone or a tablet, I just encourage you, first of all, just turn to Genesis 37. Now, I don't have time, we don't have time to read every single line, every single passage, you know, line by line, all the way from 37 to 50. But I just want to point out just some key areas to you, and we'll share some of those scriptures with you. And it begins in Genesis 37, verses 1 through 3. And I want you to hear what that says here. It says, so Jacob settled again in the land of Canaan where his father had lived as a foreigner. Now, I'm going to stop right there. You can leave that on the screen for a moment. I'm going to stop right there and unpack this for you. So you can understand the context of the story and, and who Joseph was. So it tells us very clearly, we're going to hear that Jacob is Joseph's father. Okay? Jacob's father was Isaac. Isaac's father was Abraham. So when we're talking about Joseph, I think it's important for us to understand, if you read other pieces of scripture many, many times in the New Testament and a couple of times in the, in, I mean, in the Old Testament, a couple of times in the New Testament, you're going to hear as they talk about the worshiping the one true God, it will say the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's the family we're talking about. This, this guy, Joseph, is just a couple of generations removed from Abraham. Isaac was Joseph's grandfather. Abraham would have been his great grandfather, just a couple of generations. Okay, so that's who we're talking about. So Jacob had settled back in the land of Canaan. And then in verse two, it says, this is the account of Jacob and his family. When Joseph was, Joseph was 17 years old, he often tended his father's flocks. He worked for his half-brothers, the sons of his father's wives, Billah and Zilpah, but Joseph reported to his father some of the bad things his brothers were doing. Verse 3, Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. So one day J Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe. That's where we get that story, the, the coat of many colors. We don't know what it actually looked like, but we know it was fairly ornate. It was this gift that Jacob had given Joseph as just a sign of how much he loved Joseph. Him. And so that's what we see, is that, that Joseph was loved by his father Jacob. He was loved by his father. Okay? And we also get a couple of other things that we know just from those first couple of lines. Joseph had ten brothers that were half-brothers. Okay? They were half-brothers to him. They were all older than him. And then Jacob, I mean Joseph... And then Joseph had a younger brother as well named Benjamin. What's also significant, there's 12 brothers in this family of Jacob. Those 12 brothers went on later in the Bible to become the 12 tribes of Israel. They, they, they represent the 12 tribes that, that would become the country of Israel as we know it. Okay? So, loved by his father. But there's also something in there that we read that Joseph was this upright, honorable young man, and there were moments that he would go and rat on his brothers, right? It tells us that. He would go to his dad and tell his dad everything that his brothers were doing wrong. It told us that very clearly in the text. So the next thing that we see is for a couple of reasons. For one, because his dad loved Joseph so much, but secondly, probably because he ratted on them, Joseph was hated by his brothers. And in verse 4, it says, but his brothers hated Joseph because their father loved him more than the rest of them. They couldn't say a kind word to him. So they wouldn't even say a kind word to him. I can just imagine what it's like having 10 older brothers 
and you're the favored one, at least in their eyes, and maybe even in your father's eyes, you're the favored one. You're also the one that, that's always trying to do the right thing, and you're willing to, to put your neck on the line and rat them out when they're doing something they shouldn't be doing. And it says they wouldn't even talk with him. And so the next thing that we see is that Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. And we see that in Genesis 37, 26 through 28. Now their dad sent Joseph out to go check on them. Okay? Go check on your brothers, Joseph. So he did. And it says they saw him coming. And when they did, they first wanted to kill him. And one of the brothers said, no, 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 no. Let's not kill him. And I want you to hear how this goes down. And 26, Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain by killing our brother? We'd have to cover up the crime. Instead of hurting him, let's sell him to those Ishmaelite traders. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. And his brothers agreed. So when the Ishmaelites, who were Midianite traders, came by, Joseph's brothers pulled him out of the cistern and sold him to them for 20 pieces of silver. And the traders took him to Egypt. So there's more to the story. Again, I can't get into all the details, but they saw him come and they threw him in the cistern. The Midianite traders come and they pull him out of the cistern. They sell him to, the, to these Midianite traders. They sell him for 20 pieces of silver. And what they do is they take his coat, they kill an animal, they dip the coat in blood, and they take it to their dad, Jacob, and they said, we found this coat. And they almost play it off like, do you recognize this coat, Dad? And it says, of course, Jacob immediately goes, that's, that's Joseph's coat. He must have been attacked by a wild animal and torn to shreds. And it says, his dad goes into mourning because of it. And the brothers go on with their life. But as we continue to follow Joseph, what we see is as he's taken into Egypt, he's actually bought by a gentleman named Potiphar. Potiphar falls right under the Pharaoh, the guy that's in charge of all of Egypt. This guy runs everything for him, and he brings Joseph into his household, and Joseph just does everything the right way. Joseph is just this guy of an integrity, and he's doing everything right, everything possible that he can, and, and you'll read over and over in these texts that it says the Lord was with Joseph. It says that over and over and over. And I know for some of us, sometimes that's hard for us to understand or truly believe even in our own lives when we experience this tremendous hurt in our lives to think, how could God be with me in this moment? How could the Lord be with me? But just like we just sang in that last song, he's running after you. And he was running after Joseph. So he's in Potiphar's house and there's a story that's told in Potiphar's house where Potiphar, Potiphar's wife actually comes to him. It says that, says that Joseph was this good-looking dude. He was muscular, handsome. And there's a moment where Potiphar's wife goes to him and says, go to bed with me. He refuses. Doesn't tell us how much longer. A little, bit, a little while after that, she actually corners him in a room of the house. She grabs his cloak and says, go to bed with me. Joseph, again, a man of integrity, takes off running, leaves his cloak there. She takes the cloak. She calls out to the other servants and ultimately to Potiphar. And she says, look what this Hebrew slave has done. Look how he's embarrassed me. Look how he's embarrassed you. What have you brought into our household? And so the next thing that we see is we see Joseph was thrown into prison. He was put into prison by Potiphar. And that's in Chapter 39, verses 19 through 20. And it says, Potiphar was furious when he heard his wife's story about how Joseph has treated her. So he took Joseph and threw him into the prison where the king's prisoners were held, and there he remained. Now, this isn't on the screen, but I want to read the very next line again, because I just said this about Potiphar's house where it says, the Lord was with him. In verse 21, it says, but the Lord was with Joseph in prison and showed him his faithful love. And you'll read that over and over and over in the story as you unpack these passages. Even in midst of all the hurt, 
and all the chaos that's going on in Joseph's life, it continually tells us the Lord was with him. Now, I know a lot of you probably know the story. You've heard the story before. This story is so long, we could do series on it, and we have done a series on this particular character before, the life of Joseph. But again, just for the sake of time, let me kind of condense it for you. So Joseph was in prison, or sold into slavery when he approximately he was 17 years old. Goes into Egypt, goes into Potiphar's house. We don't know exactly how long he was in Potiphar's house. In just a minute, I'm going to talk to you about how he's released from prison. When he was released from prison, he was 30 years old. 17 to 30. So there's 13 years time frame in there. We don't know how long he worked for Potiphar. It's not clear but the story, but we know a significant number of those years he was in prison. And we know that because one of the stories that's told about him in prison is these two guys that he encounters. The cupbearer to the pharaoh and the baker. And the cupbearer is the, is the guy who's responsible for, for tasting all the food to make sure it's not poisoned for the pharaoh. And for whatever reason, he's in prison. So is the baker. And there's one particular morning they wake up and they said, man, we had some really crazy dreams last night, but nobody can tell us what it says. And Joseph tells them, only God can interpret dreams. And then Joseph goes, tell me your dreams. And so they unpack their dreams for him. And Joseph tells the cupbearer, he says, your dream, what it means is you're going to be restored to the position you were in in three days. You're going to be restored to the position as, as cupbearer. And the baker goes, wow, that's really good news. Tell me what my dream means. And Joseph goes, your dream means in three days, you're going to be impelled on a pole and birds are going to pick at your eyes and eat your flesh. You're going to die. And that's exactly what happens. Three days later, the cupbearer is released. He goes back into the service of the Pharaoh and the baker is impelled on a pole. But before they leave, before the cupbearer leaves, Joseph goes, Remember me. Remember me. And the story's told, it's just a short two years later. Because, you know, two years is short when you're in prison, right? So we know he was in prison for at least another two years. The cupbearer is hanging out with the Pharaoh, as he would be doing, hanging around the table. And the Pharaoh starts talking about he's been having these crazy dreams. And the cupbearer goes, oh, yeah, I met this guy in prison a couple of years ago. He interpreted my dream. Maybe you should talk to Joseph. So the Pharaoh pulls Joseph out of prison, and he tells him his dreams. And the one dream is there's a really fat, healthy cow. And the other dream is this very sickly cow. And then the sickly cow eats the healthy cow. And Joseph goes, let me tell you what that means. That dream says, you get your dreams tell me is you're going to have seven years of just this amazing abundance and this plentiful crop and the livestock are going to be amazing and, and you're just, it's just going to grow tremendously over the next seven years. But then the next seven years, that, that unhealthy cow means there's going to be this horrible famine that's going to come across the land and you're going to need somebody to stock up during those first seven years when everything's good so you can survive the next seven years. And the Pharaoh goes, you know what? You're the guy. So he's pulled out of prison. He's put in charge of the whole country right under Pharaoh, right under Pharaoh. And it tells in the story that Joseph goes around throughout the countryside telling them when to harvest, where to store it up, how to do it, all to protect them and to provide for them in seven more years when it goes bad, when it gets difficult. I want to just unpack a couple of things here that we can learn from Joseph. First, through the pain of suffering, God continues to tell his story through us. Through the pain of suffering, God continues to tell his story through us. Not always the way we want to, not the way we have dreamed in our head or laid out in our mind that God's going to tell that story, but God will continue to tell his story through you, even through your pain and suffering. And that's what we see in Joseph's case. 
Because ultimately, this is all a story of redemption, a story of provision. Secondly, stay focused on God. Stay focused on God. We never, in any of these stories, do we ever hear Joseph lament, complain, whine, oh God, why did you let this happen to me? How could you ever let this happen to me? He just continued to do the right thing. And so that's the third thing, stay obedient. Stay obedient. And we see that throughout Joseph's life. All the way back from what some of us might call narking, narking on his brothers, ratting out his brothers when they're doing the wrong thing, he stayed obedient and always tried to do the right thing. Fourth, God is faithful. God is faithful. Again, we don't always see it or understand it in the moment. Sometimes it takes some years to go by with hindsight before we fully understand how faithful God's been. We also need to remember that God's timing is perfect. God's timing's perfect. Again, it's not always on our timeline. It's not the way we desire it to play out, but God's timing is perfect. And then lastly, recognize how God is working in the midst of suffering. Again, sometimes that's difficult for us to get, but recognize how God is working in the midst of suffering. Now, I said this perfect timing, and we see this story play out. 17 years old, he was sold into slavery. 30 years old, he's put in charge of the whole kingdom of Egypt to prepare them for seven years of bad that's coming out. So now he's 37 years old. The good years are over. We're getting into the bad years now. It's the famine has come. And it tells us in the text that there are people coming from all over the known world in that region, all the other countries. There is, it's known that they have wheat, they have food in Egypt. And so these people are coming to buy food in Egypt. Joseph's dad, Jacob, is living with his family in Canaan. And he hears that there's food available in Egypt And they're to the point where they're almost out. And he tells those 10 oldest sons, he says, I hear there's food in Egypt. You guys need to go to Egypt and buy some food. And so that's what they do. They go and they actually go in front of Joseph. That's who they're going to buy the food from. It's their brother they sold into slavery. And it tells us in the story, they had no idea who he was. Joseph recognizes them. He continues to talk to them through a translator. So he's learned another language. He's speaking another language. The translator's telling them what to say. He gives them food. In the midst of it, he knows they have a younger brother, Benjamin. He asks them about their family. And he says, one of you, you guys are spies, so one of you have to stay back. I want to guarantee you're going to come back at some point. One of you have to stay here and stay in prison. But when you come back, I want you to bring your younger brother. They leave. They don't go back immediately. It says they didn't go back till they were almost out of food again. Because they were scared. Because this guy thought they were spies. They still don't know who he is. They go back again. They take their younger brother. Just a course of events play out. Eventually, Joseph reveals to them who he is. And they are overwhelmed and scared. Right? Think about that. They sold him into slavery over 20 years ago now. Because we know Joseph was at least 38, 39. He was sold when he was 17. We're talking 20-something years have passed. And they think, oh man, he's going to be really, really angry with us. And he's going to enact vengeance on us. And Joseph actually goes, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go back. I want you to get your dad. I want you to get the rest of your family. I want you to bring them here, and I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to provide everything your family needs. And that's what happens. And there comes a point where Joseph's dad, Jacob, is about to die. And he recognizes he's about to die. He says, hey, I'm I'm about to die. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to take me back. I want you to take me back to this cave where my dad and my granddad, 
I want you to take me to the cave where Isaac and Abraham are buried, and I want you to lay my bones to rest there. And that's what it tells us in the story, and he died. And that's what they did. They took him back. And his brothers begin really concerned now because they think the only reason he hasn't done anything to us is because dad's been alive. And they come up with this kind of crazy story. It's really not a crazy story. It's a, it's a believable story. They come to him and they say, hey, dad wants you to forgive us. And I want to read that passage to you from Genesis 50, 15 through 21. And I want you to hear Joseph's response. It says, but now that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers became fearful. Now Joseph will show his anger and pay us back for all the wrong we did to him, they said. So they sent the message to Joseph. Before your father died, he instructed us to say to you, please forgive your brothers for the great wrong they did to you, for their sin in treating you so cruelly. So we, the servants of the God of your father, beg you to forgive our sin when Joseph received the message, he broke down and wept. Then his brothers came and threw themselves down before Joseph. Look, we are your slaves, they said. But Joseph replied, don't be afraid of me. Am I God that I can punish you? You intended to harm me. But God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. Think about that. Joseph was able to understand that this was God's story, that this was God's way of not only redeeming Joseph, but saving thousands and thousands of people that would have starved if Joseph would have never, ever been sold into slavery. Because he's the one who interpreted the dream. He's the one who did everything that needed to be done in those seven years of plenty to set up for the seven years of famine. See, our desire should be to arrive at that same mindset that Joseph had. To be able to go, you've hurt me. But what you meant for harm, God's going to do something good out of that. God's going to make a difference out of that. One of our biggest struggles is that so many times we allow our hurts, we take on our hurts and they become our identity. We'll say, I'm a victim of, I'm a victim of, and we live in that. That is not what God wants for you. Healing comes through forgiveness. Healing comes through forgiveness. And so my question for you today is, do you need to ask someone to forgive you because of the hurt that you have caused them? Maybe that's what you need to do this weekend. Maybe there's somebody you look back in your life, whether that was a close friend or a family member that you've hurt, and you need to reach out to them and you need to say, I'm sorry for what I did. Will you please forgive me? And there's probably a lot of you in this room that need to finally let go of whatever somebody else has done to you, however they've hurt you, and you need to go to them and you say, you know what, I forgive you for what you did to me, and I'm no, go no longer going to allow that hurt be my identity. My identity is found in Christ and Christ alone. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for just a reminder today, first of all, of how much you love us and how because of what your son did on the cross, we are forgiven. But also just a reminder for us today that, Father, we don't have to live in the midst of the hurt for the rest of our lives. Father, that we can move forward, that, that we need to recognize that what somebody meant for harm, God, you can make something good and glorious out of it. Father, we thank you for that in your son's name. Amen. We have quite a few things going on here at Refinery. I just want to touch on them. You can scan the QR codes on the seat backs in front of you and find out everything, all the details you need. You can go to our website. 
But some of the things that we've got going on are this week on Wednesday, we're going to do reveal. If you're new to the church and you have questions, you can log into our Zoom call you, from the comfort of your home and find out all sorts of things about refinery. We have Financial Peace University starting on Wednesday here at the church. It's nine weeks through Dave Ramsey's organization. It's an awesome organization. We have Refinery Academy that Chad talked about starting in September. And next Friday is our women's worship night that we would love to invite you to. All middle school girls and older are welcome to come be a part of it here at 7 o'clock at the church. We just encourage you guys to plug in, get involved, and be a part of Refinery. You guys go. Have a great week. And don't forget to tell someone about Jesus.